just a minute to hash. Yeah. Yeah. Already. stabilizing underground mining flats in Wyoming, um, using exploration techniques to find historic uh, mine workings from old Union Pacific coal mines and then designing stabilization plans for those collapsing mines. Um, if you guys ever go up to Rock Springs, their town hall has dropped two feet due to mine subsidence. So a lot of uh, Southern Wyoming is actually built up over old collapsing mine workings. Um, after that, I went Pacific Northwest um, did some work, work with uh, Ken Ross Republic Mine. Uh, I got an outside consultant, if anyone knows about that, one of the last gold mines in the Pacific Northwest, um, and worked for a, an engineering firm that had a small arm in uh, mining. The idea was to predominantly service aggregates, and uh, they were a uh, civil engineering firm that could offer large civil companies. Uh, turnkey gravel quarries um, for their operations so they didn't have to buy uh, aggregates off the local market. They could just put in their own mine at the end of the construction project, building a skyscraper or whatever, sell a mine off to someone like Meg River or CMAX, whoever might be interested. Um, from that, I got poached into Blast Movement Technologies, uh, which is going to be kind of the crux of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, 
So I should have brought one as a demo. Blast Moving Technologies makes these small plastic balls that go into blasts, and they're able to uh, give off their location after the blast. So we know an origin point and a destination point. We can use that to revise our dig lines um, after blast and mining operations. Uh, I did that for many years. Uh, Hexagon Technologies purchased Blast Movement Technologies, and now I work with Hexagon. Um, still working with Blast Movement System. Uh, I do a lot of lecturing on this exact topic that we're going to talk about today. Coming through the mines is my favorite. But I also dropped it on uh, 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 Montana Tech, New Mexico Tech, Arizona. Uh, but I always like coming to mines because it's the most fun. Uh, it's been a couple of years since I've been here, so I'm I'm happy to have had the opportunity to come and talk to you guys. What we're going to talk about is blast movement and blast movement monitoring systems. I'm not going to just shamelessly plug the blast movement monitors. Instead, I'd like to talk to you guys about best practices in blast design and kind of synthesizing the bridge between engineers, especially drill and blast engineers and geology departments when you guys get out in industry. Um, uh, just like in university, in industry, there's a lot of rivalry between geologists and drill and blast engineers. Um, and whether we realize it or not, it can uh, actually have really big impacts on an operation. And with just little best practices, uh, you can have huge impacts on the bottom line. So the first thing we're going to talk about is challenge for grade control. Now, this is, to most people, a, a geology problem. There's a lot of effort that goes into drilling, sampling, assaying, and modeling a any given part of a pit or a blast. And a whole bunch of money and effort is put into the production side of things, excavating, hauling, crushing, extracting. And in between those two things, there's some wild drill and blast engineers who say, hey, we're going to put a bunch of explosives in the ground and see what happens. And so we get a huge amount of chaotic movement. This is one of my favorite pictures, and I love using it. Uh, this is from the Soledad Operation Gold Queen out in California. Um, they were gracious enough to let us use a bunch of uh, photos from their operation for a lot of unstocked imagery. But this is a, a great example of a terrible blast. Um, and we can go into why this is not the best blast design later. Uh, but if you've taken your explosive sources, there's not very good containment, energy containment. There's lots of fly rock. And ultimately, there was a huge amount of movement in this blast. For a tight vein gold mine, Moving your material six meters is a problem. That's more than a bucket width away from where you originally thought it was. So that's where the problem comes in, and everybody blames the geologists, and the drill and blast engineers tend to get a ride. So there's the myth bust thing um, that I want to cover. The first thing is when you detonate explosives to blast, you're going to move the rock. And it almost always moves more than people think. What you see at the surface of any given blast does not necessarily represent what's happening at depth. And we can control and kind of manipulate that movement, but we can't prevent it outright. And do changing the parameters like confinement, blasting into buffers, that doesn't change the blast dynamics in the way that most people think it changes blast dynamics. Uh, blast movement's a problem for every mine. I've been to Oyakulgoy in Mongolia uh, to do consulting on their blast movement. They're a bulk tonnage copper mine where basically every ton of material is going to go through their mill at some point. But their mill is expecting a consistent feed. And if we can't meet that consistent feed, then our float cell down circuit aren't going to perform where they need to perform. So it, it, it can be very quick how not tracking that material has impact downstream. And it's not just a narrow vein gold problem or a taconite problem. Every mine everywhere is going to run into issues if they can't accurately track their material. Um, and then blast movement itself is highly variable. Um, the, effect, the effects of that variance means that blast movement cannot accurately be predicted, although there are developments that are happening, models are getting stronger. Um, that's why I'm not going to exclusively talk about the BMMs as a solution for tracking more movement. There are on the market other options out there. 
but it's very difficult to uh, really understand all of that chaos and black and that's actually how the BMM side of things came about. They're created um, at the University of Queensland. Um, the Plaster Dome operation actually reached out to the University of Queensland and said, hey, can you make us a model to predict our blast movement? At the end of 18 months, the university came back and said, no, but we made these soccer ball sized things that will just track your movement for you. We've since refined the technology. They're about the size of a grapefruit or a bocce ball. Um, when you guys get out into industry, there are famously a couple of mines up in Canada that have BMM bocce ball sets on their man camps. Um, if you see one of those, you'll know I was at that mindset. Um, so this is just a quick overview of BMM. Like I said, I'm not going to talk too much about these yet. We'll get into this later. Um, but basically, there are these little balls. You put them in the ground. They survive the blast, and they transmit their location. Again, we use that equipment you see there on the far left. That lets us find the post-blast location of BMM, origin, destination. We can, we can do some pretty cool stuff with that information. But first, we got to talk about some about well, yeah, uh, do you put those balls in the blast hole or do you put in a different hole? Great question. Uh, we put them in their own standalone hole that's not loaded with explosives. They're very durable, but they're not so durable that they can survive being surrounded by an infill. Problem with durability. How many do you lose the blast? So globally, uh, and it varies on our region, um, we have about an 85% successful detection rate. So eight and a half, nine out of 10 BMMs you'll find post blast. However, that number skews. So in Canada, they average about a 97% detection rate. Um, in other countries like South Africa, we're down around 60%. Some of that is blasting practices. Some of that is uh, quality of work and it all kind of comes together. And also, production and timing. Sometimes there's just not enough time to get out on the blast before shovels have to move in. So that that's the real real world dilemma. Yeah. So can you like use these balls like multiple times or okay, one time? Can you use again and again? That's a great question too. Uh no, they're designed as single use. Um so any site that buys them, uh we provide them at safety data sheets. And they're basically designed to go into the mill feed and pressure, and, and there's very little material in them, so they're not going to affect float cells or commutation or anything like that. They just get crushed up in the mining operation. We've had some um, interesting anecdotal stories where um, our green color BMM is the exact same color as uh, one of Forica's boosters. And so we've had mishaps where people have thought uh, the green BMMs were undetonated boosters. But other than that, they, they're designed to just get dug out, put into the computation circuit. Any other questions? Um, when you distribute these ancillary poles for these balls, uh, what is the ratio between these and the blast rate? So ultimately, it depends on how many there are contacts for the material we're tracking. So if we just have you know one simple contact, let's say we're out in iron ore up in Michigan. We've got a waste contact and an ore contact. That's all we care about. We put BMMs right along with that contact because what we care about is where is that contact moving post blast. Yeah. Let's say we got something a little bit more complicated, like uh, Kumba iron ore in South Africa, where we have 14 different ore classes based on concentrations of phosphorus and potassium and iron. And we need to know what's moving where so we know where to stockpile it. In that case, we may install substantially more BMMs um, to track it. You know, I've seen 30, 40, um, most I've seen in blast is 41. So it's not a systematic distribution. No, no, it's not systematic. What you want is I mean you can do that if you were say researching or trying to understand larger uh, dynamics at play, but usually from a production standpoint, what we care about is where the contacts between the material types we care about are moving. Really good questions. How much each of these cost? That's a great question. I will get into that at the end. Um, <laughs> but depending on how many you buy, uh, they're about 350, 450 US um, For the recovered value back to mine sites, they usually pay for a year of the system in a single blast with improvements in uh, material recovery. So, 
talking about just some general blast movement dynamics. Um, this may be a review for a lot of you guys, new to some of you guys, but what is blast movement? When we detonate the explosives in the ground, we're rapidly releasing energy to fragment the mineral resource. What is that energy? It's gas. That gas is going to exert its force equally in all directions and start fragmenting the rock in the path of least resistance. That's what we're taking advantage of in blasting and why we don't detonate every hole at the same time. Uh, those rocks begin to move and turn, act on neighboring rocks, which results in both material movement. Um, as the blast holes go off in sequence, we have that propagation effect going back and the material moves into the gap. So this is like a three frame mid blast. And it's moving into that gap of material that's already moved in front of it. This is happening on the order of milliseconds though. So it's not something you're going to see per se on high speed cameras. Um, and then that material settles in the new direction. In general, if we initiate a blast at our initiation point and we have these nice uniform timing contour lines, what we're going to see is the blast detonates going back this way and the material moves perpendicular to those timing contours towards that initiation point. That's blasting on the very high level. In the real world, designs are almost never going to look like that. The, it, the reality is very few blasts are perfect squares or rectangles. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. So here's an example blast that has a lot of things going on in it. And there's some general trends we can see here. First one is movement is perpendicular to those timing contours. That movement is highly varied. We have VMM monitors that we caught in this blast in the southern half that aren't displacing uh, nearly as far as what you see happening up here. That's some of the real world variability you can see in any given blast. And then we've got uh, movement kind of follows some general trends in what we call five major zones of the blast. You can call it four if you want to put front faces together. So you've got buffered and open front faces, power troughs, center lines, and the body of the blast. And each one of those areas have a general trend of movement that we see. And this is an important concept because we're going to build up why we care about how the material is moving, especially as blast engineers. We go out and start designing blasts, thinking about some of these aspects will make the geologists and often the mill quite happy. So the first thing is the body of the blast. What is the body of the blast? The body of the blast is anywhere away from an edge of the blast, away from an initiation point, center line, power trough, front of the blast. This is where we have uniform movement for blast. Uh, so take that with grain of salt. What we usually see is we have our semi confinement on top of our explosive column. This detonates, the material moves horizontally with a little bit of vertical uh, displacement. That vertical displacement is usually the key for the bl material blasting and randomly reorienting, what we call swell. And what we see from a VMM standpoint, these are four VMMs we put in a single 15 meter hole up at a mine site in Canada. Um, so we have one VMM right at the sub drill contact at the bottom of the bench, and then evenly spaced up there. This VMM number eight that was in line with the stemming column. And what we see is this five, six, and seven, the orange, red, and green VMMs, they actually all have a very similar movement profile. Lots of horizontal displacement, very little vertical displacement. VMM eight up here has a whole bunch of vertical displacement and not a lot of uh, horizontal displacement. Why is that? The energy that was moving this. VMM, the energy that's moving this material at the top of the blast is coming from below. It's coming from the explosive column. Again, that energy is exerted equally in all directions. So the material in, in the stemming column level is going to move more up. This comes into play if we're, say, in West Africa and we're doing 10 meter benches with four flitches, two and a half meter mining horizons. Suddenly, one or two meters of vertical displacement could put us in a whole different mining horizon. So we have to um, be conscious of that when we're thinking about our designs. It's not just a horizontal displacement, it's a vertical displacement problem. 
So this is just one of my favorite graphs. It's uh, a bunch of different blasts from uh, four different mines uh, all around the world, all with very similar geologies, all very similar mining operations. Um, but they're blasting at wildly different cover factors. And what we're seeing is a lot of different movement. But what we can get out of this is the yeah, amounts that are shallower, material that is shallower tends to have less horizontal displacement than material at depth. This is why earlier I said what you see at the surface isn't necessarily representative of what the full movement is. The other thing that I like to draw in this graph is uh, line D in particular. Their range of movement at depth was from five to just past 11 meters. Those were BMMs in the same blast, different parts of the same blast. So they, these BMMs were only about 50, 60 meters apart from each other. We have very, very different movement. And that, yes. Um, what's your uh, dashed line? In? That is just a, a general representation of the shallow we are, the less horizontal displacement. It's, like, it's the average of everything. It's actually slightly off because I messed up my presentation slightly, but it's close enough. Um, the next zone is the front face. And depending on if you talk to even among my colleagues, we kind of some of us group this into one zone. I break it out into two separate zones. We've got open or free face and choked or buffered faces. Choked faces might be anything from material that hasn't been mucked and when was left for this blast, or maybe we're actually blasting into unblasted material. Maybe it's the first blast on a bench or we're in a high wall. We have some other kind of unique constraint. And the dynamic we see right up at the front of the blast in each of these scenarios is slightly different. So with an open face, when this first row of holes, second row of holes, when this material detonates and starts moving, it has nothing to confine it. So that energy is going to blow it out. We're going to see this nice little angle of repose slope form. We'll have some big boulders down here at the bottom, more than likely. And what happens is the BMM rise out into that. And the material that's up here, it actually blasts up and then settles out onto that pile. Um, again, if we have high grade ore or something we're really interested in or need to track up at the front of the blast and we're, and we're using unconfined, we might want to think about that. Now, what most mines tend to do, whatever material is here, they'll call this all that material. But if we're in flitching or some other kind of operation, we may start to worry about where we draw the line between those material types. When we're choked or buffered, um, the gas still needs to escape. That energy still needs to go somewhere. So what happens is this first row of holes goes up, material fragments, slams into this buffer, whatever that buffer is, fragmented or unfragmented material. If it's fragmented, you might get marginal mixing along here, but what ends up happening is that energy finds the next step path to get out, which tends to be straight up. And so what we tend to get is a lot of onlapping from material here, onto that blast. If it's all the same material, we're not going to worry about that. But if we've got high grade gold or copper right up here and we just shot it onto a buffer of waste material, even if it's six or seven truck loads worth of material, doesn't seem much in the daily life of a mine. But if we do that on every blast for a year, those numbers start to get very large. The final thing is power drop. This is the back of the blast. This is where we've reached our last row of holes. We may have pre-splits. Um, we may not, depends on the mine. And what's happening here is this last row of holes detonates. That material moves forward. There's no new material coming in behind it. And so we get this depression where the material that blasts it up settles down into the power trough. Again, I keep hammering on this flitching uh, analogy. If we're flitching and we just drop our high grade material into a lower flitch, we're going to care about that. If we're mining this in a single pass and we're both tonnage copper, we may not worry about this as much. As a general rule of thumb, uh, I found larger power troughs usually mean larger displacement because you've created more area for that material to drop in. I've seen power troughs the entire depth of a bench. Uh, in iron ore, where their powder factors are astronomical and they're sending rocks to Mars. Um, I've also seen power troughs where you get them out to the blast and you couldn't even tell where the back, back of the blast is if it weren't for a little bit of heat. 
Why aren't they just called troughs? Like, what's power about those troughs? You'd have to ask people who made that name. Yeah, okay. uh, okay. I have no idea that's what we call it. And again, we've got an example of the BIM data here where at depth or typical horizontal displacement of that shallow material drops down into the power trough. Yeah. So is this like BMM give you like trajectory of the, I don't know, when it's like fly, is it like give you the trajectory like so that you can calculate both horizontal and vertical component? Uh, or we you we like have level? something on, on that line, yes. Um, but the data you're seeing here is the, um, the kind of the current commercial version, which is uh, more like an avalanche beacon in function. We know its origin point. We're able to pinpoint that destination point. And, and by doing uh, some of kind of our proprietary magic, we can actually equate the signal broadcast um, and some information therein into the depth of the BMM so we can get XYZ origin, XYZ destination. And from that, we can create a vector. So the final zone is, I, I break it out from the other zones because this is the first part of a blast that is entirely controlled by a blasting engineer and his or hers particular designs. Everything we've talked about, about up to this point, pre-phase, combined phase, power cross, body of a blast, even if you don't see a power trough, there is still in effect that power trough there, it's just so minor, we're not seeing it. So all of those previous zones, those will always occur to some degree on every blast. However, the center line of initiation depends entirely on that blasting engineer and how they tie in the blast. So in de-blasting, which is by a long shot the most common kind of detonation uh, configuration you'll see in industry, we've got our initiation point and we've designed our tiny contours in such a way that propagates out like that, and material moves in like that. Now, on ramp shots, if we're advancing a ramp down, we may end up needing to do a really tight deconfiguration because we can't send that material anywhere else. We want to lump it up in the middle of a blast so a shovel can go in or a front end loader or whatever we're using can go in. But that's not necessarily the best design in terms of movement. Because what we have happening here is along this center line, we have a material from each side of the blast converging onto that center line and mixing. We'll typically see a lot more heave and we'll see a lot more mixing. If we've got material that we care about tracking and we just mixed it with a bunch of material that we don't want to mix it with, that's a problem. So the first thing a drill and blast engineer can do is shallow out their timing contours. And what that does is instead of sending that material into the material from the other side, we're starting to aim it more towards that initiation point. Uh, I've got some examples to further highlight this, but that's ultimately going to create or lead to a more consistent result. Not necessarily predictable, but we'll see a lot more general movement trends that we can uh, then use from a great detail perspective. So short-term planning and drill blast impacts. Again, the center line of initiation. So this is real data um, from a mine out in Africa. They prefer to only install one color per blast. Um, work, we don't technically recommend that, but what they've done, this is on the same bench, about the same geology, slightly different blast perimeters, but this is pretty typical for what you'll see in industry. This first blast, they did a crazy sharp timing contour. And you can see these VMMs are moving all over the place. There's some perpendicular movement, but not everywhere. And the movement variability is all over the place. This is very difficult to work with from a grade control perspective. If we have four or five, six different blocks in there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I just want to ask and the the during the blasting process. So how do you consider the mind? Yeah, the mind. And uh, the, the, the magnitude of the cost for each blast. And again, like what are the challenges you face during, during the process? So, as drill and blast engineers, the biggest challenge they're going to face when they're going into a blast is 
fragmentation, right? That's what they're designing for. They don't want to over fragment. They don't want to under fragment. You're trying to hit that magic target. Usually a drill and blast engineer is not going to care about any of the geology unless it impacts their fragmentation. And so they may do a blast like this because they want to pile up the material in the middle so the shovels can just advance straight down the middle. And maybe they find that they get more on target fragmentation when they've done this really tight timing because there's more energy in that middle causing better fragmentation. And so that's one of the big challenges. But from a grade control perspective, if we're looking at this, we just do chaos. And, and, and how are we going to try to track material in there? And, and then delineate that out for the shovel operators to go and dig reliably. So, <clears throat> the drill and blast engineers, a lot of times, they, they're very set on something like powder fracture and inner row and inner hole timings, but just making changes, right? We don't need to change our drill hole spacing or our powder factors um, or explosive type or anything like that. Just by changing the sequence in which we tie up those holes with that inner inner hole and inner row timing, can massively change what the outcome of that movement looks like. So in the, again, in this example, we talked to the site into shallowing out those timing contours from their usual standard. And you can see the movement, the magnitudes of displacement are hugely variable. There's two meters to almost 11 meters in this particular example, and these are VMMs that are pretty close to each other, but they're all moving perpendicular to the timing contour. Now, this is something great control, the geology department, they can come in and look at that and say, hey, we can displace our ore blocks, thinking of that, and have it be more reliable, because we've not created as much chaos. Um, and this would apply to more than just the VMM system. If we were trying to model this, um, with AI or other models, this is still going to create a better end result. It doesn't matter what platform we're using for tracking uh, material movement. Uniform blast movement is always better for every operation. So that's better for grade control. And it also by taking out factors of chaos, it can actually help your drill and blast in here understand what's going on with their blast. If they're having consistent over fragmentation problems, but their blast designs always look like this, it's hard to diagnose if it's coming from their geology or coming from timings. So like I said, there's a couple different ways uh, of detonating any given blast. You've got that one, the blast center lift. There's also multi uh, initiation point blasting called segregation blasting. Um, I'm I'm not going to talk about it in this presentation, but I'm, I'm super happy to talk about it after. It's pretty wild and crazy where we have multiple initiation points and super complex designs. But fundamentally, when we detonate an echelon, we're detonating at the corner of any given blast, and we're moving all of that material in one single domain of movement. All of that material is going to move towards that initiation point. When we go to a V blast, we're moving our initiation point onto one of the faces of the blast and creating a center line. Each side of that center line is a different domain of movement. Material here, moving towards that center line, and material here, same thing towards that initiation point. They have fundamentally different directions of movement. So if we were going to try to track material movement in these sides, we want to think about each of these domains differently because they're not going to behave the same. They're fundamentally moving in different directions. Same thing for center and lift, also called the drop shot, diamond shot, paddock cut, a um, bunch of different names, same result. We move that initiation point into the body of the blast somewhere and effectively create it to the center lines. We've now got four domains of movement. Each one of these domains is fundamentally moving in a different direction and we want to think about it in a different way. If we're using blast movement monitors, we want to put blast movement monitors in each of those domains of movement. And to get even more complex, center lines do not have to be straight. They can zigzag, they can curve, they can, they can go a full 90 degrees on a blast. It just depends how that drill and blast engineer has tied in that blast. So now we're going to start synthesizing against geology and the shapes of our ore blocks. So we've got a hypothetical here. 
We've got a dashed line which represents our geologist delineation for a high grade board block. And we tied in our pattern in such a way that we're shooting that ore block along strike and we're displacing it five meters. If we don't account for that material movement and we mine this original shape, we've incurred 30% dilution and 30% ore loss to that one block. If we now tie it in in such a way that we're shooting 45 degrees lead to that strike, um, but displacing it the same five meters, and we mine the original shape without accounting for movement, we've now imparted 55% dilution and 55% loss to that block. If we shoot it across strike, so not the best direction to move this particular shape of block, again, same parameters, same five meters, 70% loss, 70% dilution. So the shapes of the ore blocks that the geologists delineate out can inform your blast designs and how you're sending that material. Now, this isn't the perfect world. In reality, you might be waiting for assays, uh, or the geologists might be waiting for assays to do an ore delineation in any given blast. As a drill and blast engineer, you're going to have to make a decision tie in the blast in some particular way. There are tricks you can use. You can reference the blast above it. You can reference blast around it. You can go and talk to the geologist and say, hey, what's the strength and depth of this ore body? You know, where do you think the ore material is? What shape do you think it is? And you can try to refine your tie-in to, again, try to create as much uniform movement and send that material as best you can. Um, so again, just really harping on this impacts of blast design. Um, we've got uh, two different blasts. This is what uh, the site in Nevada actually tied in for this given blast. Um, when this particular site loves center lift, even when they don't need to, um, they did an entire bench where every blast was a center lift. So this is what they tied in. This purple zone is basically all the area where we have the power trough. This red zone is all the area where we've had that crazy center line mixing and chaos. And then this white area, each one of these domains of movement or where we had that body, that uniform movement. And then this is where they actually ended up putting their BMMs. And they did recover them, but you can see they didn't get anything in this domain of movement. And they didn't really get the best captures or use or placement of those BMMs. A lot of them ended up in center lines and have very strange movement. What they could have done, very simple, same blast, by moving the initiation point right there, they could have had this large uniform body of movement and most of these BMMs would have fallen in that and they would have had a much more predictable post-blast material movement. That would have been easier for their operations more than likely to mine out. So here's an, another example, still picking on this site in Nevada. Again, these are real blasts that they designed. These are their actual ore blocks. This is their high grade gold material, more than three grams per ton. Any more, that's pretty screening grades. And they slice up these blocks with center lines, creating a lot more chaotic movement and introducing a lot of chaotic movement at areas of contacts. That's going to result in dilution and ore loss. Material that was high grade is going to wind up out on the tailings pile and the mill is going to be paying to process weighted material and not get recovery. And if say we have sensitive float cells on top of that, maybe it will also hurt that day's average recovery. So this is where typically I've picked on people and they've called them up and make them come up here and arm wave and design free blasts. I'm not going to do that to you guys because this isn't actually a university. Of course, you guys are all here willingly, but if you've got this scenario, we have to design three blasts. We've got three ore blocks. How would you design three blasts on here? Um, and I'll take you guys through how I would design it and why I would do it. First thing I would do, center lift over here, all in waste material. Why a center lift? I don't know. Why not? It's all in waste material. We're not really worried about how that material's moving. Second shot, I would do an etch one. The reason I would do it in etch one is I'm thinking about the shape of this ore body and I'm trying to get it to move down strike as much as possible, moving along that long axis. 
So I'm going to put my initiation point there. Here is going to move like that. Now, a lot of times I hear, oh, should we do X1 for every single blast? No, not necessarily, because a wide angle B may actually work better. So in this scenario, if I blasted these two blocks in X1, putting my initiation point here, really good for this block, not so great for that block. Same thing, if I put it up here, it's pretty good for this block, but now this block's moving pretty oblique to strike. By putting my initiation point here and sending the center line right down the middle, I can actually split the difference and get these blocks moving in a much more ideal direction. And again, all we've done is move an initiation point. We haven't changed any, our powder factors, our explosive type, anything like that. And we, we've probably made some geo pretty happy. And also probably the surveyors who have to go out and mark out the delineations. So a couple guidelines um, for minimizing ore loss and dilution just on the high level for me, a blast design standpoint. Appropriate blast design. Think about all of your movement dynamics. Try to get arm yourself with information. Yes, of course, we have to get designs out as quickly as possible. And the geos may not have the assays back, but a five minute conversation in the geo office at a mine site, as a drill and blast engineer, you can probably get a pretty good idea of where everyone's anticipating a material in any given blast. And you can adjust your designs accordingly or invite a geo to your blast design meeting with the drillers and get their input. Directly measure displacement of polygons as a shameless pitch for uh, BMM, though there are other solutions on the market. Understand blast dynamics. Know how your decisions and changing tie-ins and things like that can affect movement. We've also got things like changing powder factor. More powder factor usually means more movement, less, less movement. But just upping powder factor or decreasing powder factor has rolling implications. Dropping your powder factor to reduce Material movement also is going to change your fragmentation, and that may very well cause bottlenecks at your primary pressure or piss off the operators who are big rates have now gone down, or maybe they're going through, uh, wearing through their ground EDC too fast. So there's lots of things. Ultimately, communication. The lack of communication between these three departments, you would be shocked when you get out into industry. Geos, Drill blast, short term planning. I've seen it where, in some cases, not even are these guys not in the same building. They're not even on the same mine site. Where short term planning is sitting in maybe a regional office or even back in headquarters. And so they kind of get cut out of these two discussions. And maybe drill and blast are in two different buildings. So going out of your way to reach out, try to include geos, short term planning. So the short term guys, they may be able to say, well, we don't need to go into the bench right there. Maybe we could go into the bench somewhere else. And that suddenly that changes the angle that you're attacking the ore blocks and you can start moving that material better. And all it did was say, short term saying, oh, well, let's do this blast instead of that blast. You know, bottom line impact to the actual operation. We say to anticipate production pressures, but you guys will learn that pretty much every day on mine. Um, but always keep it simple. Complicated blast designs look cool and detonate awesome, make for great YouTube videos, um, but they're not going to be great for the operation. Um, so just to talk a little bit about BMM specifically, um, we BMMs are deployed at about 137 mine sites around the world. Um, depending on the operation and the company, we have pretty much one mine using BMMs with all the major gold players uh, in the world, including a bunch of sites in Russia that we can't currently do business with. Um, but BMMs um, are placed in very particular ways. When you guys get down into industry, there's a good chance you'll run across a site that's using them. Um, and what we say is put BMMs as close to the bottom of the stemming, but below the stemming as you can. If you're single pass mining, or if you're flinching, which again is multiple passes, you're going to want to put BMMs at every level that you've got um, a flitching operation going. So again, we can track that material. And I've got some real world examples. We'll kind of deep dive on this. Now, why does vertical movement matter? As it keeps harping all, all along is flitch mining. 
not very common here in North America, though it does exist. This is bread and butter in West Africa. And a lot of the gold mines out there, three, four, sometimes five flitches are the standard. And a lot of times what happens is we've got our flitch elevations defined. We blast operations that says, great, we're going to keep the flitches at the same level. All that heave is just going to get lumped up into that top flitch. If the geologists are then told to reconcile that top flitch, well, they have a, a whole lot more tonnage than they initially were expecting. So one of the interesting things you can do with a product like BMMs is you can actually start to think about how should we adjust our flitching elevations for any given blast. Now that's a dangerous question because operations tend to be really angry if you keep changing the flitching level on them. But you can start to identify trends. Let's say you've got five, six, seven blasts. You can average out those and you can say, hey, well, we usually have seen this many meters of displacement. So have that discussion with short-term planning and operation. And we've got our flitching elevations to try to more accurately capture each of those flitching horizons. And then suddenly geologists' reconciliations start going up because they're not having all this material disappear or appear in any given bench or any given flitch. Um, so again, this is just kind of a, a complicated conceptualization. So we have a material moving in three dimensions, and if we don't account for that change in flitch elevations and movement, we've got quite a bit of loss in dilution. And by thinking about both horizontal and vertical displacement, again, these are or we can go full three-dimensional shapes, but a lot of mining companies have hard times chasing complex three-dimensional shapes. So we can simplify it and adjust, track for our horizontal movement and adjust our vertical flipping elevation. And suddenly we can start to really reduce our potential loss in dilution. Um, so to just kind of tear, uh, end this off, because I know I'm running out of time, uh, here is some data from one of my favorite mine sites up in Canada. Um, we put a whole bunch of DMMs in this black detachment. It has two ore blocks. This is a very, very early, just after their pioneer blasting shot, one of their very first production shots. And they are flitch mining, two five meter flitches. Um, and what we had was very interesting horizontal displacement. So here's our histogram bend in one meters of our number or our general material movement. And then here's looking at it in terms of flitches. Where you can see the bottom flitch saw much more horizontal displacement and a little bit broader spread of the data versus the upper flitch, which was almost entirely semi material. They stemmed to about four meters on a five meter bench. So we've also got vertical displacement. Uh, this one's a little harder to follow. Uh, so this is our install depth and this is our vertical. Placement. So you can see the BMMs at depth had much less vertical displacement. BMMs that were shallower saw a huge range of vertical displacement. That's because when you look at a blast, it's not perfectly flat. You see huge heavings and things like that. Again, for a flitch mine like this operation is, they want to start considering and thinking about how having up to five and a half meters of heave on a 10 meter bench was impacting their operation. For a 10 meter bench, five meters of heave is a, is a lot, but you'd be surprised you'll see things like that all the time. So do BMMs actually work from like the noodly high level thing? Yes, they do. Um, this is a paper I worked on uh, with Anaconda Mining, a small kind of mom and pop operation out in Newfoundland where their reconciliations were terrible. They implemented the system. This is a rolling average. 2015, they started seeing improvements. After that, they were able to keep their reconciliations, their F3s, under 5%. Interesting. And they continued this trend to the end of my life. They've now gone into reclamation, unfortunately. Um, but excellent uh, performance. And uh, one of the things they noted is because of the confidence they had in the system and the material tracking by 2018, they actually reduced their minimum uh, mining unit size because they had the confidence to chase smaller blocks. 
in, in an era of declining grades, being able to chase that smaller mining unit with greater accuracy helped prolong their mine life by almost a year. Um, again, this is just shameless plugs about the BMMs themselves. Uh, this is the current generation of BMMs. Uh, they have a G-Force sensor in them. They sense the blast and turn on. And you can install them days or weeks before the blast goes off. They'll hang out down hole. And when the blast goes off, they either turn on and start broadcasting their signal, or let's say you blast at the end of every shift and there's no one around to pick them up. You can delay them for up to 99 hours. Let's say it's a holiday weekend, everyone's going um, going home, or famously, it's Nevada and it's opening uh, weekend for deer hunting. No one's going to be on site. So you can uh, delay the BMMs for however long you need so that someone can get out there and pick them up. Um, they are stemmed with material at installation. And that's for two reasons. Reason number one is if you put them in a hole and you don't stem them, they have a tendency to pop out and be found at random points around the pit. Number two is if we just drill 18 holes to put 18 BMMs in the ground and we're not stemming those, suddenly we're giving all of that gas a whole bunch of new avenues to escape out of the blast. And it doesn't seem like 18 holes in a pattern of 400 holes is going to make a difference. But every one of those unstemmed holes is a new pathway for that, that energy, that gas to escape and not do its job fragmenting more. Thank you. That's it. Any um, quick hats? I have too many hats. They're really nice hats, too. Um, and feel free to ask me questions. H mining is normally the back holes, right? Yeah, yeah, although I have seen uh, a front end loader glitch operation where they actually drove up and, but oh, usually, yeah, it's excavators and backup. Yeah. So you mentioned that in uh, the increase, uh, powder factors increase block movement, which that makes sense. So then does that mean that in like mines like iron ore mines or so like in um, Northern Minnesota, is there a lot more blast movement there? Because you have to you have to hire. Yes. Um, without saying any names. So the first yeah. thing we also have to think about is material density. Yeah. So, right. When we go into iron ore and we're going into materials that are 4.4, 4.5 on density, they're going to take a higher power factor to just get the job done. So that's that's why it's a general rule, but that's not always the case. Material densities and things like that create a lot more nuances. Now that said, and I'm glad you picked on uh, Northern Minnesota, we just did some work with one of the operations out there and they currently hold our record for material displacement um, in terms of horizontal displacement yeah. where uh, they sent a single BMM in the material, right? This wasn't a BMM that was out of material. 223 feet. That's like a record ahead. But it should be the borderline cast blasting. Yeah. Uh, but and their power drop was astronomical. Now, things like that are definitely the fringe case. Yeah. Um, but we do see that. And, and their power factor happened to have been extremely high. But they also had very, for their power factor, their, their drill density was also pretty dense. So they have a lot of things going into play. The upside is the post-blast muck pile was a very nice, easily blocked material that almost looked like beef gravel. So okay. uh, it, it was almost too fragmented. Okay. Then also, are you Canadian? No. <laughs> the reason I ask is because I saw a lot of spelling in the uh, presentation that were uh, English, uh, meaning from England, like spellings. 